In the name of Jesus. Amen. Our text is the Gospel just read, reviewing these words. Jesus' Jesus's disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? When you take a look at the Old Testament reading from Genesis and the Gospel, what a stark contrast. Because you find Adam placed into a garden, which is placed in Eden, and there everything is ripe, it's verdant, it's flourishing, there's a bounty there. What if every meal were like Adam's meals in the garden? where you could just go out and pluck that ripe tomato which tastes like summer. Not like a hothouse tomato, something grown in Canada. No offense, Canadians, I do like tomatoes from there still. But one of those tomatoes which tastes just like a tomato should. Or uh, apples and, and grapes and oranges and, and the other bounty found in the garden. And there you could just sit down unhurried and delight in that meal. That's probably what every meal should be like. There's no desolation, no emptiness to be found in the garden. Instead, there Adam is enjoying the fruits as well as being in the presence of God. Unashamed, unworried, naked. There he is. And then you have the Gospel reading. The people have been in Jesus' presence for three days. And they are taking in every word that he gives to them. In this, they're feasting and there is bounty, but as they look around, they're in the desert. They're in a desolate place. There's nothing to eat. Nothing to survive by except the word of God which Jesus is giving to them. But that doesn't satisfy the body's need. They need food. And so, there in this place where they've been unhurried receiving Jesus' word... Now Jesus says, we can't just be concerned about the soul, we must also be concerned about the body. We have to provide for it them. This is the compassion of the Lord. To care for the ones he created body and soul by seeing to their body and soul. And so then he says to his disciples, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way and some have come from far away. This brings an end to the contrasts, I suppose, between our Old Testament and Gospel. And now we move on to something new. What Jesus provides in the desert is, in fact, a restoration of what was to be found in the garden. In other words, Jesus is bringing into this desolate world a bit of bounty, a bit of the verdance which we should have known but do not know because of our fall into sin. Now, living here in West Michigan, I suppose, it is kind of like being in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Having come here from Saskatchewan nine years ago, my wife marveled at how everything here is green and everyone has a green thumb because everyone's gardens are rich and full and lively. Even those of us who don't know how to garden seem to have beautiful gardens. It's rather amazing. Well, we know that here in West Michigan, we're not actually in Eden. We've seen our dry spells and grass growing brown. 
But Jesus also brings here and now Eden into our presence. Maybe not into our gardens, which are now full of weeds, but right here into the divine service for Jesus desires to provide. Just as he provided in the desert so many years ago. Jesus tells his disciples after they ask him, how can one provide for all of these people in this desert, in this desolate place? Well, what do you have? And they look. And they find seven loaves. Now it's that at that point where maybe one of them could have said, you know, we've got seven, but let's just tell Jesus we've got four or five because we need to keep a little back for ourselves, right? They don't do that. They don't let the sinful flesh get in the way looking at the numbers of loaves and saying this is what we need versus this is what the people need or this is what Jesus needs. They simply stated, here are seven loaves. And then Jesus takes the loaves and he blesses them and he gives thanks for them. In doing this, Jesus is preparing his disciples for two things. First, a life of stewardship of all of the things that God has given to them. But then second, their unique life as stewards of the gospel. The first one applies to us all, doesn't it? Because God has given to us, sometimes more, sometimes less, different points in your life, God gives to you great bounty, like a, a garden that's absolutely full, and then there are points where it seems that all of the blueberries have been picked off by the ravens and the squirrels and whatever else lives in the neighborhood, and now there are only a few left. But God gives. And He is the one who is the giver. We are simply the ones who have received and then act as stewards like the disciples did. Do we keep anything back? No. Instead, the Lord knows what he's given. The Lord entrusts us with wisdom and also those around to serve. And so we give. We certainly give to the church. God be praised for that. He's given directions for us in the Old Testament to set aside 10% and use that. But in the gospel, there are no restrictions. Instead, God gives freely and we give freely as well. And God be praised for that. The remainder, though, is used in relationship to our neighbor. And in doing this, we are reflecting God himself to the creation, making known the invisible God, revealing that God is compassionate by caring for our neighbor in need. Sometimes it's just that fellow who sits down at the kitchen table at night or that beautiful bride who has been sick for a while and you bring out the meal. That is God serving. You're showing what God is like to those around you at the table. But so also within your community. Giving as you've been given to. So that's the first thing Jesus is teaching his disciples. The second, though, has to do with their unique work. What are they to do? They are to give what Jesus has given and what does he give them here? Bread, broken, bestowed upon those around in an abundance that cannot be counted. For how do the people eat? Like teenage boys sitting down at a buffet, right? Have you seen how many plates a teenage boy can fill and empty? Oh my goodness, it's rather amazing. Sometimes we men exercise a little bit of restraint, but in our teenage years, maybe not so much. The people eat and are satisfied to the full. And what here Jesus reveals is just how God is giving. 
Not necessarily food, but his riches, his mercy, and his grace abounding. Jesus is teaching his disciples then what they are to give. For soon he will give them a supper. A supper wherein he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And how does Jesus give in that meal? Bounteously, abundantly, giving himself under bread and wine for our sake. Just think about this for a moment. In order to do that, Jesus must take himself and our sins to the desolate place of Golgotha. And what does he do? He waters the dust with his own holy, precious blood flowing forth from his side. One river which breaks forth, bringing a brand new Eden. Not just four rivers extending out to the world, but numerous. In fact, we cannot count all of them, for Christ brings into our present day a river of blood which cleanses us from our sins. Here, today, is the new Eden. Jesus breaking forth as he brings heaven and his righteousness right unto us. A bounty, a feast, where we break from the desolation of our lives caused by our sin, our hurtful words, our anger, our confusion, the violence found within this world, as we well know from last night, all of that desolation and here Jesus brings to us a beautiful feast. One where we pause. One where we receive. One where we are filled in abundance with His righteousness, His mercy, His forgiveness, His life, so that our lives are not empty and desolate, but instead filled with Him, His compassion, his love. Yes. This is what Jesus is teaching to his disciples and also what he is giving unto us this day here in this place. No wonder there's this tree of life flowing forth from Jesus, growing forth from him who took the dead tree of the cross and brought forth this tree of life for our sake with rich Fruit, fruit flowing forth from Him. When you come and receive this day, realize what you are receiving, not just bread and wine for your sake, but His body, His blood, better than any summertime tomato or some juicy ripe blueberries picked from the bush. Here He is for you. And in bringing this bounty to you, this fullness, this richness, this fertility. He's also then exalting you. For you humbly come forth, opening your mouth, holding out your hand, and, and he fills it. Now all of this brings us back to what happens next with Jesus and the disciples. The people are filled and they're sent away full. Not empty, but full. So also Jesus sends you away today full. He does. And you go out. You go out into the desolation of the world, knowing the violence and suffering and sorrow and death that exists there. And then you come back here for another feast. But there's a day coming when he's not going to send you away anymore. There's a day coming when you won't face desolation and death anymore. Jesus has prepared for you not just a, a little bit of a feast which you can slow down for on a Sunday, but a forever feast. It is coming, dear saints, when you'll be welcomed back into the Lord's presence unashamed, covered in Christ's righteousness, 
and you'll sit down and you'll eat. A feast that will never end, where everyone is fully satisfied, where there is no complaining and no regrets, and no need to hurry. For there you shall be in Jesus' presence forever. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.